right away. Um, good evening, everyone. Today, we present to you our second session of Viram. And we at Viram are a committed group of seekers, if I may. We're an organization of academics, administrators, artists, and students who are sworn to the cause of gendered nonviolence. As a collective, Viram shifts its gaze from manifest and explicit to latent and everyday workings of symbolic gendered violence that seek an expression, an outlet. Emotional abuse and psychological experience of suffering is a reality, unfortunately, in gender asymmetric relationships. And we as members of Viram feel that these cannot be permitted to become an accepted norm and a way of life. As a platform, we thus launch an expressive protest against this institutional silencing of everyday violence. But any protest we feel must first be based on an intimate and experiential understanding of the suffering and in fact, uh, the experience of suffering by the experiencer. In Viram, we thus aim to create a respectful and trusting environment for people to narrate their stories and seek ways to emerge out of their quagmire. So in today's second session, we will be discussing gender and space on how built environments have an intimate relation with the well-being and mental health of a gender. And uh, I'm very happy to be introducing uh, my dear friend, Dr. Paz Concha, our guest speaker for today. Dr. Paz Concha from Chile is an anthropologist and PhD in sociology from the London School of Economics and Political Science. She has conducted ethnographic research on street food markets, placemaking, atmospheres, commercial districts, and tourism with projects in London, Santiago de Chile, and Peru. Dr. Paz has worked for the Chilean government as an independent researcher and consultant. She's currently working as an adjunct professor at the Institute of Urban and Territorial Studies and is a researcher at the Center for Social Conflict and Cohesion Studies and a freelance consultant. It's wonderful to have you amidst our spas. Paz has been a dear friend of mine since our days at the LSE and in fact, uh, my roommate at the Cumberland Lodge where I presented my paper on the cup and side. So bienvenidos a Dr. Paz y todos sus alumnos de la Universidad Católica. In today's talk, Dr. Paz explores the connection between gender violence in cities and reflects on how cities are relevant for the social and symbolic construction of gender differences, inequalities, and violence. She will be looking specifically at processes of urban development and how women use public space in Latin America to interrogate this issue more broadly for the global South context. It is interesting that we discuss gender and space today because Viram as a concept, as a term, also denotes a liminal space essentially for negotiation and reflection. I'm also happy to have our special guests with us, our members of Viram, who will be interacting with us throughout the session. A warm welcome to also the students of Dr. Concha who will be joining us from the Catholic University and of course our, our members of Viram. So um, I would now request uh, you pass to deliver your thoughts in today's second session on gender and spaces, please. Thank you very much Priya for that introduction and for having me today. Uh, one of my students is here, hi Consuelo. <laughs> Uh, and of course, many more, I hope many more are watching live on YouTube uh, at the moment. So I'd like to share a few slides with you. Um, this will not be uh, uh, an academic lecture, but more of a, can you see my slides now? Can you see my screen? Say yes or no. <laughs> yes. Yes? Okay. Excellent. So as I was saying, uh, this will not be an, an academic lecture, but more of a conversation or more of a um, um, presentation and different things that I'd like to bring in onto the discussion so we can later on have uh, more questions and comments about 
our own um, understanding of the relationship between gender and space and the differences between our own cultural context, which I think are, are different, but the, there's, there must be lots of similarities. So today I will be talking about first my own positionality, where I come from and, and specifically our context, what is happening at the moment in terms of uh, gender and feminist uh, uprising uh, in our country, but also in our more broad uh, region. And, and secondly, I'll be talking about uh, gender and space, specifically thinking about the, our city, public space, and how that shapes our, our experience of, um, of gender. And uh, secondly, on intimate space, specifically our bodies, and or embodied um, perception of gender differences and inequality. So first of all, and just to give you um, a context, I'll be talking about a lot of different issues that are happening that have happened in the recent past. I would say the past three to five years in Latin America where there has been an uprising of, of feminist protest and gender awareness in terms of the political situation, but also on claiming more rights for women and understanding or the places where we live in a more uh, gender aware um, way. So here we are. This is what you can see here in green. It's Latin America for content, continent where um, quite far away from India here, uh, but I'm, I'm sure there'll be a lot of things that we can bring in to compare and contrast. And specifically, I'm in Chile. So here, where you can see in red, um, the last bit of our continent, um, we're a small country, only 17 million people, but uh, we're also a middle-income country, so within the Latin American region, we're more affluent than most of our neighbors. Um, but with, unfortunately, with that, our economic growth, um, economic inequalities have also uh, have been rising. And that's a particular uh, issue that we need to consider um, as it has been uh, the we can say the the thing that has promoted a lot of protest and a lot of discussion in terms of how we can achieve a more fair society and a more fair country. So and also um, so that's where I'm. This is where I'm talking uh, from. You know that's where I'm from. This is where I'm based, and this is where and uh, from where I'm. I'm examining this issue uh, more broadly. But at the same time, we're also in a particular moment in time, moment in history, where there's been an uprising in feminist movements and feminist protests, specifically those that have to do with our um, human rights, uh, social and reproductive rights, uh, lots of, of um, protests about legalizing abortion, for example, but also for um, finding a way in which we could um, live in more um, uh, safe environments. So there's lots of, of protests about um, well, this one, this picture here on your right, it's from Argentina. And this other one, you can see this Latin American feminist from Chile to Mexico against a uh, feminist state. So there's also a lot of, um, of um, protest and conversation and discussions about uh, not just domestic violence, but all sorts of violence against women. We're talking about physical violence uh, and how we can live in a society that is safer for us and for um, the future, the future generation as well. 
So this is something that has been happening all over the place, uh, specifically since 2019, like right before the explosion of the pandemic, which is another really important context that's been part of my reflection at the moment. So uh, we as women are also in an historical time where we are being asked to conduct a lot of the work professional but also the reproductive work to sustain our families and our society so most of our health workers are women and um, we as women at home uh, have to conduct a lot of our caring uh, activities and caring work for our families um, especially, especially now that we are uh, we've been having all these lockdowns uh, and where all of our domestic work has been in a way been more visible for society in general so there's lots of pressures uh, for us at the moment to um, gain more recognition and also at the same time to gain more um, uh, rights for to conduct our lives and to conduct our work in a society that respects and encourages to grow uh, and this is uh, just you can see from the graph here this is um this slide shows in argentina during lockdown women have a higher uh, a higher load of domestic work and caring work so at least 51 percent more of of overwork uh, and this task were mainly cleaning the house, looking after children, helping them with their schoolwork, and also meal preparation. So in 2020, at least half of the women in the country were feeling um, quite um, uh, stressed about having to fulfill all of the productive work, but also all of the reproductive labor at home. And this has uh, an extraordinary impact on how women have had to leave their their paid jobs in order to complete this domestic task in a way that we haven't seen before um, because every year we see more women going into the workforce but with the pandemic we've been um, cutting down hours and essentially um, just finding our place back at the household in, uh, instead of conducting uh, more professional activities. So what I want to talk about now, now that you know the context and kind of the issues that are, are at stake is about um, our cities, gender and space. And when we think about our cities, we, we have to think about how we can build safer and more equal places for us uh, in terms of all the different activities and also the intersections that are part of our everyday lives. We're not here just talking about women and all the difficulties that are to, for example, going around the city in a safer environment, but we're also talking about accompanying children uh, to the playground. We're talking about the elderly, looking after family and or or looking after someone with uh, some disability to go around their business in the city so here like transportation links and everything that we do outside the home is really important um, in a way that we can find um, better spaces for us to conduct our everyday activities so when we think about planning of cities and mobilities uh, we need to consider a gender perspective so we can create e more equal cities and more equal transport links we as women usually are not just only going from home to work but we usually do a lot of different activities in between we pick up children we leave uh, uh, we put children in school or we go and buy groceries or go to the pharmacy in between, or looking, go and pick up something for someone else. 
uh, we accompany people who um, to the doctor, to doctor appointments, or to run errands. Um, so we usually uh, looking after other people when we go about our business in the city. Therefore, transfer links, for example, have to um, find a way of uh, adjusting to what uh, how women experience their everyday mobility. Uh, that is it's very different from how men usually go about their everyday life. So they usually go from home to work and then from work home. Um, and there's nothing in between. They can travel at peak time. We, we, when we can travel at peak time when we're carrying a baby buggy or when we're carrying groceries or other stuff. So we need to find different ways to, um, go about our everyday business uh, to accommodate our journeys. Sometimes, uh, having to go, um, in public transport that has substandard quality or having to wait for longer at bus stops when there aren't enough buses, for example. So there's lots of different things that will create um, a more difficult uh, everyday life for us when we go about our business. Um, if we can't consider gender as a specific aspect of uh, urban planning. But there's also other things that happen in the street and these things have to do with our presence or bodily presence on the street. We usually um, have to take a lot of different actions in order to feel more comfortable when we go about our business in the street. This means dressing differently, uh, going out um, when it's not dark, or coming back home early on so we can, we can avoid um, unsafe uh, places or we can go back home feeling more secure. There's lots of different things that we do and we usually normalize the fact that we have to dress differently or take different paths or ask people to come with us to go about uh, our everyday business. Um, and there's lots of, uh, and this is not just in our context. This is something that's happening globally. Uh, we kind of, we find in our friends support uh, so we can take care of each other when we go outside. So this idea of text me when you get home is trying to look after someone else, someone who cannot go about their everyday life just um, uh, in a more free environment. But we have to look at a lot of different things um, to prepare ourselves to go out at night or to go out in, in the evening. So there's lots of different things that have happened here, not just, uh, well, the text me when you're home. This one is, I believe this one's from London, but this is also from Latin America. Let me know when you get home or on the way home, I want to be free. I don't want to be brave. So asking a friend if they have arrived home safely is just another way that we can you know, exemplify the idea of not feeling safe um, in, the, in, in public space. And when we think about public space, we're not just thinking about the threat of other people, but we're also thinking about a lot of different urban design elements that, that in a way are making us feel more insecure. So this is um, like, um, I don't know if you've, you ha you've seen this before, but there's lots of like continuous wall walls that make you feel a lot more unsafe because if you think about walking here at night, there's no place to run and there's no one to ask for help. So that, that kind of construction usually um, creates a lot more in insecurity or insecurity perception at least in people. So in terms of urban design, there's a lot of things that we could still do to make cities more comfortable and, and safer for women. Uh, and this is um, just uh, um, statistics about femicide or feminicide cases in 17 countries in Latin America. This is from 2019-2020. Um, there, there have been order in terms of the highest uh, proportion, the highest cases rates per 
per 100,000 women. Uh, and you have countries where there's been, uh, during the lockdown, uh, the rate has been slowing down a little bit uh, because there's less people on the street, mainly. Um, but domestic violence has increased a lot. Uh, I don't have the, the data here, but the fact that we've been in lockdown makes um, homes uh, a place that is not particularly safe for women. So from 4.7 uh, cases per 100,000 inhabitants for women in Honduras, we have the, uh, and this is just uh, not pure luck, but uh, with a smaller country and safer country as in Chile, we have the lowest rate. But you can see Brazil and Mexico have a lot of cases as well. Um, and this is something that we've been um, seeing across the continent, protests about um, uh, the increasing rates in feminicide or the killing of women, usually by their partners, by their partners or former partners. Um, so the movement of new una menos, not one less. Uh, we want us alive. Uh, we want us alive, free, and without fear. This is something that you can see in many different cities across uh, across Latin America as a way of uh, making um, domestic violence and and physical violence more visible as well. So I wanted to show you a short video about. The highlight of the highlight of one of this protest against um, physical violence, but in a way that has been intertwined with the importance of using and occupying public space to make these issues more visible. So, in terms of of gender in cities, the city as a scenery uh, for um, protesting and for raising awareness has been. Uh, quite relevant for uh, our countries. Um, so we need to go outside in public. We need to occupy symbolic public spaces to protest and to make more visible these uh, different struggles. Um, so I'm going to change screens now because this is in, in YouTube. Um, so I'm going to be sharing this again here. This is a, in the Guardian page. Can you see this? I hope you can. You can also listen to this. I'm not so sure. Let me know if you can see and yes. hear correctly. Visible. So here yeah. it is. Is this accompanied by a, a sound pause? Because we can't hear really anything. Oh, you can't hear. Okay. So there's, there's sound as well. Let me see how can I share this again with sound. Just one second. Uh, 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 um. mm, 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 mm. This one. Okay. Can you hear now? Yes, perfect. Oh, my God. 
Okay, now with that video, I wanted to, I just wanted to show you uh, that to conclude. And, and so we can have a, a more broad discussion about some of the issues I've just highlighted here. So I'm, okay. I look forward to your comments and, and Absolutely. more, more comments than questions, I would say. That was really, in fact, I was grooving to that um, song. It's so powerful and so well coordinated, if you come to think of it, really. So um, I think we'll start taking questions. I have a question, Baz, uh, before my members and volunteers uh, come in. So uh, one concept of work from home, it's ideally considered to be a very liberating concept in that sense, you know, that you're working from home and that you have the privilege to work from home. But I guess a lot that I'm taking from your talk is that while it may seem liberating on the face of it, um, the twin task of production and reproduction, as you mentioned, is, is something that is confined within this home, which can also be a very difficult space um, to negotiate with. So if you could just tell us a little bit more about how maybe the home can uh, similarly be such a difficult space as maybe the urban public space, if you could have any, any of your thoughts about it, because another member of ours, she's asking, why a sudden rise in domestic violence and shadow violence, what we are referring to after COVID? Yeah, um, thank you for, for your question. Um, so the home is a place where we've been uh, confined <laughs> for most of our life until maybe the 1960s, uh, where women start having professional uh, activities outside the home. Uh, in a structure, uh, in the city that's been structured for productive activities right at the center and the sub suburban life where reproductive activities happen. So we've looked at the home as, a, as the space for the family, the space for um, where you can be yourself and the productive space as the place where you have to um, carry on um, economic activities. Uh, so we've been dismissing reproductive work as an economic activity per se. Uh, and that's something that has happened from, as I was saying, the 1960s until now, where there's been a lot of questioning about who has to um, care for the family and how we could, in a way, monetize that reproductive work. Um, so how we can bring in or we can acknowledge the value that the caring work has for society at large. Um, and I think that there's been a clash in terms of, you know, um, there's lo a lot more need for caring work right now with COVID. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people have, have lost their jobs, uh, especially women who are usually have to take care of family. Uh, um, especially when kids are not going to school uh, because, you know, COVID restrictions, etc. So th I think there's been a clash in terms of what is being needed from us, what we can actually contribute, and how, um, I would say, public uh, space violence have moved from the streets into back into our homes now that we have to spend a lot more time together. <laughs> Than we maybe we want to, um, but, but it's compulsory. So all of this issue, I think it's like um, there, it's like a boiling pot, you know, for for the uh, for the increasing number uh, in domestic violence. But I have to say that this idea of liberation through productive work, in a way, is always um, represents an oppression for someone else. So when we, as professionals, go outside and work uh, in corporations or in government or have like professional activities, we always have to let uh, another women, usually from poorer backgrounds, looking after our homes, looking after our children in a way. So um, the I think the increasing numbers of professional women uh, is something that not happening for everyone it's just happening for some of us uh, and there's other women who have also been are in 
more precarious conditions and more precarious jobs. Um, looking after uh, all of those tasks that we left back back at home. So I wouldn't say that necessarily professional activities are liberating for everyone. It's just for some of us. Thank you, thank you, Paz. That was uh, very insightful. I'm also reminded of this uh, scholar, Paz, Petra Doan. She mm -hmm. spoke about the tyranny of gender and how, uh, you know, sometimes even spaces, uh, especially uh, gender in a binary fashion, when it's spatialized, it can be also something very restricting and uh, very limiting for, for let's say, gender-based identities, which may be intersectional. Intersectionality is a concept that you mentioned and how, you know, the, the gendered experience may just intersect with race, ethnicity, uh, class, age. Um, so if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, how could, in a way, urban design interventions take into consideration this experience of intersectionality? If you could just tell us a little bit about that, yeah. because of course we're trying to deconstruct gender here as well as not this yeah. essentialist identity of being a woman or a man, but about being so many things. Yeah, so the idea of intersectionality um, makes the discussion a bit more complex in terms of we need to look at all of these different categories that are being oppressed by patriarchy, essentially. Um, and this different categories is not just about being a woman uh, but also about different or more fluid gender identities it's about being someone that's been valued by society in terms of our age or race or ethnicity uh, or income or educational background etc so when we think about a more inclusive urban design we need to consider that um the population needs are very diverse and we need to find and design, I mean, we need to find these needs and transform them into solutions that are more suitable for a more diverse um, public. So most of the urban, most of urban design interventions and when we think about how um, roads are being built or how lighting is being put or how um, commercial spaces or uh, all of the kind of public activity spaces are concentrated in the place instead of distributed. Those are ways, um, uh, just examples of how the city has been planned for having an ideal individual, and that individual is usually male, young, uh, with an able body, um, and usually just having to go from home to work and then back. So when we think about that particular individual as the normal measurement for all decision making, we're leaving behind the needs of uh, diverse groups of people. So we need more uh, playgrounds in different places. We need um, traffic lights that last for longer because when you have elderly population, you take longer to cross the street. Um, you need to have streets where cars slow down so you can have more quiet streets and more public life for families and, and for people with, um, I don't know, a neurodiverse uh, kids, for example, uh, people with autism, they need more silence. Um, so there's lots of different needs that you need to consider. Women, we also are doing all of our shorts. We usually carry more stuff around, <laughs> not just our, you know, our, our handbag, but our shopping bags and our, a, a buggy or, um, you know, go, going with someone else who also carries a lot of stuff like a wheelchair or, uh, or something else. Um, and, you know, when we, you go into the street, then you start seeing all of these obstacles to go around the city carrying things around. And those obstacles are there because no one has ever thought about, you know, we maybe need to design this, this street uh, in a way that are more comfortable for people doing all sorts of different things. Uh, and not just, uh, you know, driving cars, etc. cetera. Um, so then that, there's lots of things to consider from how streets are built, how 
lighting works at different parts at night, uh, how we can plan for uh, more transparent bathtubs, for example, um, the way that we can have more uh, parks that are open, not just for small children, but also for old people. So we can have, you know, gather people from different ages uh, in different spaces. Those are things that we need, we can, you know, consider. Um, in a paper that I, th I think I sent you the link, uh, a paper we, I wrote with other colleagues, uh, we've identi identified um, different urban designs that create more or less protections or sections of security. So these walls, like continuous walls, are usually something that's quite scary for us to go out, to go there at night. But also, for, for example, public uh, public restrooms. So having public bathrooms uh, can increase your perception of um, of insecurity. But on the other hand, it provides something that's quite useful for us women. We usually go more, you know. We use the restroom more because of our period or because we're pregnant and we need to pee more or because we're, uh, you know, walking with small children who need to use the restroom or with elderly people. So um, the provision of public restrooms is something that usually is not considered something that is essential for um, younger, uh, I would say, society, younger population. In here, uh, public restrooms are not, uh, you, uh, it's not the norm, like you don't have found them everywhere. You have to pay to go there, so, uh, so, some restaurants so you can use the, the loo. But in other cities, for example, in mainly in, in what I've seen, like from traveling, like in Switzerland, in Zurich, there's so many different public uh, facilities where you can, uh, there's a lot uh, more, you know, the population is also older. But um, that's something that you can easily find and makes your life easier if you're, you know you have to go around and use public space uh, more widely, uh, not just you know to commute. Absolutely. Uh, okay. I think we have a few more questions from our members of Viram, so I'll give it up to Diksha. Diksha, let's let's have your thoughts, and this is also to remind all our viewers. Uh, about an article. This has been very well researched by Paz and uh, it would just make sense that after today's talk if all of us could you know sit together on one of our reading group sessions and read uh, Building Safer Public Spaces Exploring Gender Differences in the Perception of Safety in Public Space Through Urban Design Interventions. A very interesting read indeed where uh, Dr. Koncha talks about urban design and planning policies and how we need to integrate a more gendered perspective in our urban design interventions. Uh, yes, I'd request Diksha now to take over. Diksha, let, let us have your thoughts and maybe after Diksha we can have Shorumi and Rolishri. Yes, uh, go ahead, Diksha. Hello, uh, am I audible? Very much. Yes, Perfect. I can hear you. Hi. Thank you, great. It's good to hear you. It's really nice to hear the things that we talk about. Uh, not sure if these are questions, just thoughts. I think I'll just like say what yeah, I like to sure. say So the first thing that I would uh, point out is that it's so beautiful that, you know, when we're talking about gendered spaces, when we're talking about such things, we talk about the mundane stuff. Stuff that people don't generally, you know, consider it as important to be talked about. And it is so very important for us to bring these things into perspective. So I love these things whenever we are talking about, uh, especially when we're talking and I just feel more in uh, where there is there are more women in this in a similar space. And I'll tell you why am I saying that uh, we were talking about how, uh, you know, the infrastructure is built in a certain way when we're working outside. I uh, work outside of my house. I go out every day. And the place where I work is very, very able-bodied, uh, kind has a very able-bodied infrastructure. We have stairs to climb. We have three floors to climb in order to, uh, for us to be able to record lectures, etc. So now somebody who is not uh, an able-bodied person cannot, uh, you know, like go ahead and do all of that kind of stuff. One is that. Apart from that, it's, it's a social venture. So that space is built out of very little resources. And I understand that bit about it. But at the same time, the basic facilities which regard, you know, women's existence in that space are almost invisibilized. 
and when i say that i mean that there is a washroom which has which is made for women and then there are no dustbins in that there. there's no dustbin in the washroom and it's it's a it's i don't know it's just so it's appalling to me it's harrowing to me it's it's scary to me how we just invisibilize the importance of such simpler things in our spaces the use of dustbins the the placing of dustbins is so important are we then kind of discouraging women to step out of their homes to be able to work is that is that isn't that something that should like isn't that a prerequisite isn't that something that people who are running organizations or any sort of platforms should be knowing that, it, that it's very essential to somebody's needs and requirements apart from that when i talk about i all women spaces or women dominated spaces when i walk out so i have i have lived in uh, the national capital of this country and it's a very very uh, the the space has a constant male gaze which is which is there like it's just persistently there you're living with it so when you're living with it you just develop this kind of like i developed a lot of anger then frustration and then also indifference you know eventually that okay it's just persistently there you can't do much about it so now when i've shifted to my hometown following the pandemic i've come back to a smaller city so all of this male gaze doesn't really affect me as much as it would it used to in a larger city but when i walk on the streets at night i leave the office really late because i'm working till late and then i leave the the space is filled with men and this has spoken to a lot of women about how you know when streets are filled with men or and there if you see just one woman also walking alongside even if that woman is not related to you in any shape form or sort it just makes you feel safe in some way and that is so important so there are two things that i'm talking about one is obviously you know the invisibilization of needs and apart from that the you know the importance of more representation in a simpler space like streets also so something like that apart from that when this is this is another chain of thought that came in and when we were, we were talking about gender uh, when we were talking about working from home and how you know the roles have started emerging now i think the gender biased roles and based roles have always existed the thing is that it just came into light right now like how we were talking about in our previous uh, session about agency that agency is there it's just there we don't we don't acknowledge it or we we haven't tapped it in a similar sense this entire like there was a woman who was always catering to all the needs waking up at 4 am doing all the work in the household and then leaving the house for work and then coming back and working but nobody was acknowledging the work that she was doing outside and inside the home unless until she started doing both of these things in the same space so you know it's just always been there this kind of work distribution the inequality and all of these things have always been there we maybe haven't cared enough to see and acknowledge that and there is a very interesting thing that one of my friends to talk was talking we were talking about about how my mom doesn't listen and you know like she's very inconsiderate about her uh, health etc and she said that you know just imagine that for us home is a space where we come back to and we are relaxed now we think that okay now this is the space of comfort at least this is how the larger perception of home is idealized to all of us but just think about a person if you're constantly living in your office if you're constantly working working staying there also and then waking up again to work for a homemaker essentially that space becomes their workplace and also their home so where does then comfort lie where does this feeling of safety and like you know the feeling of relaxation then where how does one find and negotiate in those spaces and do we really talk to homemakers and people who are working in the same place and also living in the same space trying to seek comfort in those spaces are we talking about it enough so i mean these were some just some thoughts while i was listening to you thank you so much for listening everybody thank you dikshan are we taking more more comments or can i respond a bit Yes, Paz. There's something very interesting that I uh, just came across. It's called Geo Chicas. This was a group created in uh, Mexico in 2016. So essentially, uh, it's spread to 22 countries now across Latin America and Europe, and it organizes mapping events so that women who face gender-based violence in Latin America can get safe and reliable information. um so i find this very interesting and even uh, we have an organization here in india also called safety pin 
uh, which began in Delhi. And it sort of uses uh, crowdsourced data from women to develop maps for unsafe uh, places, unsafe areas in cities like New Delhi here and Bhopal. And they're working with the government. So there are a lot of interesting... Right, I didn't, I didn't know this. This is great. For yes. example. Yes, so there's some interesting work that's going on here as well. Um, in case we have more questions, we can have them now. Um, Shorami? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say to Dixa that I, I love the, your comments because talking about the mundane, we usually don't do that because it's not you know, academic enough. <laughs> uh, but it's part of our everyday life and, and we're trying to make um, our existence more visible. And our existence are also mundane. It's not just, you know, theoretical work about our gender experiences. It's also about our lived experiences. Um, and I, I was thinking about these ideas of sorority or like sisterhood uh, when we encounter other women and, and we can feel that we can approach them when we're in, in a place that is not feeling safe or where we're with, uh, feeling... Um, that there's a lot of, of male gazing. Um, so I just wanted to say about the idea of gender space, um, Daphne Spain, that's on, on another reason that maybe you can add. And this other book that is more recent is from Caroline, Caroline Criado Perez. It's called Invisible Women, uh, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Uh, it's not particularly about space, but she um, makes a, an analysis of all of the different everyday objects that are usually defined for men and not considering other bodies as the norm and how that makes our everyday life more difficult. From, you know, the seat belt in your car to um, the, the fact that there's always the same amount of uh, toilets for men and for women in different places but we use toilet a lot more, therefore there's always a queue outside the women's restroom. Uh, instead of having more, more facilities for women and less for men, so we can, you know, avoid queuing and waiting a long time everywhere we go. So those are the things that she looks into and, and it's a very interesting reading. Um, it's not academic, she, this is just a, a, a more of a like a fiction book, non-fiction book, but it's really interesting. I think that you might find that enjoyable. And I love the thing that you say, Pri, about uh, Gio Chicas. I'm going to look at that because it, it's going to help me for my for my teaching <laughs> as a as an example. All right. I think we have a few more questions. Do we, Shorami? Yes, ma'am. Please, please go ahead. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma uh, that was a really insightful talk, and I really could re relate to it to a, a whole lot extent. So, taking on from what Diksha mentioned, and those were some really great points. Uh, I would just want to uh, put two comments. Uh, that uh, first of all, how uh, home becomes a space for resistance and negotiation in some very implicit ways. For example, if I have a fight with my husband. So I might just, you know, try to bond the roti and give a bond roti to my husband as a sign of resistance that, you know, what you did or what you said was not good. So like how these spaces become ways of resisting, especially for homemakers, because their work, and as Diksha mentioned that uh, how uh, all of this has come to light post the pandemic and even uh, how the exploitation of women from the lower classes and from the lower castes has come to light post the pandemic because it existed even before the pandemic but we have come to focus on that just because we are staying at home and you know working from home and uh, the homemakers who were already at home and the second point that i would like to mention is about how people who do not conform to the binary for example gender fluid gen uh, gender non conforming people people who are non binary how they find home as a place of uh, place which is restricting for them for example i have friends who are gender non-conforming and they tell me that how uh, in their homes they have to conform to certain kind of rules certain kind of uh, so, uh, certain kind of regulations and they have to uh, constantly um, 
uh, imbibe a, a, a certain kind of roles and uh, live by a certain kind of disciplined life which probably wouldn't have been there if they were staying outside home so how uh, the home which is actually a place for relaxation and comfort uh, becomes a place where your movement is restricted and you have to watch your thoughts and especially in indian families because uh, here um, although not most of the families uh, like i do not know the exact demographics but uh, like most uh, people uh, around me they live in joint families and here the concept of private space is uh, very limited like you cannot just sit uh, sit in your room and just cl- uh, close the door and put on the latch and you just uh, do you do some work or you just spend some time with yourself like that's unthinkable in most of the families so uh, like how in such spaces uh, people often strive for a little freedom you know a little uh, walk around the balcony a little a me time or a alone time uh, so as to you know like just revive themselves thank you sir ami um i think what it's a very difficult question how we can make homes a place of resistance um it's hard for me to think about especially in the context of covid when there's lockdown you have to stay home like there's no <laughs> option um and i think that creating optional spaces outside the home is really important when the home is not the place that it feels safe anymore uh and optional spaces i'm thinking community spaces or thinking about public space that feels more welcoming and more comfortable for as you were saying more gender fluid people as well and also for women places where you can meet and hang out without uh feeling left out or discriminated against uh that is really very important um and at least in santiago what i can see is this lots of um uh communities especially lgbtq plus communities that have found in public in certain public spaces they have built uh those are safer spaces so where they can play music where they can meet where they can talk and not feel discriminated against and having that uh, and and when covid starts and that option disappears that brings in the violence into our homes in a more uh visible way uh, not just in terms of physical violence but also in terms of feeling left out or critiqued about our own identity um so i think it's really important what you say um uh, the home might not be a place for resistance during covid <laughs> but we can find ourselves a home somewhere else in, in public space you know home is that's the saying that says home is where the heart is so we can put our heart somewhere else that feels safer all right there's another question pass that we have um so uh the presentation the slides that you shared with us and of course uh, uh the obvious gender differences that exist in spatial organization do you think this points to a gender data gap or are there deeper reasons to it do you think there are more structural and more cultural reasons that are so deeply embedded that sometimes be- breaking the structure is considered to be prohibitive uh what does what do your ethnographic experiences say to this pause the very fact the manner in which space is organized do you think there are certain deeper cultural uh, structural reasons to it mm. Mm. i think there are <laughs> and one of the issues at least from what i'm seeing is that urban planning and architecture are professions that are uh, mostly men that are uh, studying those professions so from you know the university onwards into professional work um if you only have one um uh one vision about how city should be and how place should be even when your um training to become a professional planner or architect that certainly creates inequalities in the way city is defined in the future as well so from my perspective i think that the way that the profession is being taught at the university is really important uh, when you bring in new 
ideas and new visions like the five, the things that we're talking about right now into the classroom that really resonates and creates a difference uh, for um, future planners and architects in terms of occupying, uh, uh, you know, for women to occupy more spaces, professional planners as well. Um, I think that makes a huge difference. So there's a gender imbalance from how cities are defined from the from the beginning, from the origin. And so if we can overcome that, in a way we can open up spaces for more ideas to to get on board into urban design and planning. Uh, so that's why the, I'm teaching a course called Gender and the City. And I love having people from different backgrounds and different professions. This is an optional course, so I have students from all different degrees. Uh, so I like having that because there's a way and the way I can spread the word <laughs> uh, to more people. Can you just turn on one second? My dog is scratching the door. He wants to come in. Go ahead. I think Rolishri had uh, a question. Rolishri, do you have a quick comment to make? Yes, ma'am. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk thoroughly. It was really great to have a Latin American pr perspective um, because mostly we hear our Indian perspective, so it was really nice. Uh, one thought that I had was, and we don't talk such many things, but it mostly goes unobserved, but it is really important to talk about how public spaces are different for different genders, I guess. For men, it translates to having spaces for leisure or for their attitudes, attitude is relaxed and it's a space for their enjoyment. While when women walk, they have a destination, a mission. They're very focused and they usually use it as just to commute. They're, we are always alert. So this is a great difference in attitudes when we uh, go around exploring public spaces. And another comment which I had was, um, in one of your slides, you used the phrase, I don't want to be brave, I want to be free. And that is a very powerful and intriguing quote in itself. So um, my comment is the burden of avoiding violence, even uh, as gruesome as rape, fall back on the victims instead. And I guess the real problem arises when this mindset seeps into policy making as well. So, can you please comment on this? Thank you for your comment uh, uh, and question. I think that, um, well, I'm, I'm not necessarily a policy expert, but something that I've always uh, thought is, as you said, it seems like there's less space for us to enjoy ourselves. <laughs> and as you were saying, we kind of use the city in a more functional way. You know, we do this and that. We are kind of all the time measuring, you know, what time are we going to get there and how long are we going to have to wait for the bus or the subway or whatever transportation we're using. Um, I need to go back home at a certain time because it, it, it gets, you know, dark or dangerous or I need to be home for making dinner or whatever else. Uh, picking up my children or picking up my brother or someone else you know, that you're in charge with. Um, and these things are not necessarily considered when we think about uh, the provision of public space. Um, so the, I think the challenge is to make public spaces that are more enjoyable for women to spend time at. And on the other hand, the fact that we have such a strong workload makes us less um, no, there's the less options for us to just go about and enjoy ourselves. We just don't have enough time. <laughs> uh, so I think that with shorter commutes, um, you might have uh, a little bit more time to, uh, you know, leisure time, as we call it. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't know if Consuelo is still here, but she's been researching about uh, leisure time and how we are not allowed to have leisure time. And most of our leisure time is just the commute. So during our commutes, we listen to music or think about other things. Uh, if there's still enough room, maybe we can read a bit. Um, 
And it was interesting to see in her research how women would describe that commute, even if you're just walking uh, to catch the bus or whatever, uh, at a time where you feel free, where you're on your own and when you can have your own, uh, you know, your own time. So I think that, again, with COVID, when we don't have to commute, we have lost some of our, of our space and time to just think about ourselves and just, you know, we don't have to commute. So there's no, we use it's, it's, it, all of our time to do something else. And we don't leave that and, and we don't leave enough room for us to, you know, think about ourselves or, or lives or just, you know, whatever, read a magazine or read some stupid news about Hollywood or whatever, something that distracts us from, from everyday chores. Um, so essentially that, uh, we, we don't have a lot of places where we can hang, but also we don't have enough time to do that. So there's, and there has to be a change in the, in the way that we distribute our time so we can become more heavy users of, of public space as well. Paz, we have your students here as well, don't we? We'd, we'd love to Yeah, I think Consuelo was there, but I'm not sure if she's there anymore. I can't see her. All right, let me, let me, let me. No, she's not there anymore. But All right. Oh, no, she's there. She's okay. there. Okay. <laughs> Very much there. That's great. Would she like to say anything? Consuelo was my master's student in oh, right. her master's dissertation, and we wrote a paper together, but unfortunately it's in Spanish, so if you, if you can't read Spanish, uh, it, ha it hasn't been translated. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Do we have any more comments, suggestions, or feedback? All right. I think we're done for today. Oh, all right. We have one now. Rocky, yes. Oh, please, go ahead. Okay. So, first of all, I would really like to thank all of you for such an insightful and very important discussions that we are having around gender and space. And it was really interesting. And uh, so, there's just a um, small thing that I would like to add on. And if, if the time allows in, uh, anything, we could also have a discussion of few minutes around that so when we're talking about gender and the space and we talked about that how you know we have normalized certain actions on the everyday activities that we as women when we go out in the public when we are you know when we choose to take a different path because of the safety purposes or we choose to dress differently because of the you know reasons that we do not or we just want to avoid a certain kind of attention or a male gaze um uh, acknowledging all of that, there's one thing that I would really like to flag off here is the internalization of those patriarchal values and those forms of control which exist within our own uh, mind or the way we look at ourselves. For example, when I'm right before when I'm moving out, the fact that I am a vulnerable body. I am a, a woman or any other gendered body. You know, I am a vulnerable body and the chances of uh, and by by performing certain actions or for example by uh, dressing in a certain way i am avoiding my chances of get being uh, called out or eat teased or getting you know raped or howsoever so how do we address these uh, uh, are the way we have internal internalized those male gaze and those the uh, the vulnerability aspect within ourselves as women so the question of our own agency i mean uh, how do how can we sort of acknowledge that and, and address that and understand the the larger aspects of those uh, uh, power equations that exist you know between that conflicted positions and that vulnerability that exists within our own self as our own identity and our, as our own bodies so yeah i hope you um, uh, i've articulated it pretty well so please i mean if you're getting what I'm trying to add on here, can you please give me some of the ideas or some of your ideas around yeah. it? Yeah. Thank you, Raki. Um, that's really interesting, really important what you're saying. Um, so we've internalized this uh, ways of behaving um, through uprising, I would say, so, or moms <laughs> usually tell us you need to look after yourself, uh, your skirt is too short or whatever. 
or don't use heels because you might need to run or whatever else. <laughs> it's difficult if you're in heels. Um, those kind of things uh, we learn through, you know, the uh, our socialization and also uh, education. Um, but what I think is, um, and now that I'm um, I'm a mom and I have a boy. <laughs> Uh, there's something that we need to do, and let's also educate our boys as well. <laughs> uh, so you you shouldn't just educate women to feel more safe, but you should also educate boys to make women feel safer, safe as well. So the idea of building safer environment is something that is not just our responsibility; it's a distributed responsibility uh, towards men and towards everyone uh, in a position of uh, decision making, so politicians as well. So having acknowledged that we're normalizing things that are not supposed to be normal and making that visible, I think that's a really important first step because when you acknowledge that, then you can work towards making everyone else aware of those uh, inequalities. Uh, especially those in a position of power, uh, where we can start building safer environments from, uh, you know, from the, the crib, you know, from when we're little, up towards educational systems, uh, and when we are, you know, older as well. So I think that there's many, as I was saying, that responsibility needs to be distributed and to be thought of something that it's. Um, has to be done by uh, families, but also schools and also the political system for, and for women and for men as well. Uh, so we usually, when when you have those concerns, and as I would say, as a feminist, when you have those concerns, you feel um, quite um, overwhelmed. <laughs> but there's so much we need to change and how do we start changing that this thing is just a process and one of the things that we should do is just to feel um, to distribute that concern across society so we don't feel that press that a lot a lot of that pressure so it's, it's everyone's responsibility i would say not just us uh, uh, hi, uh, uh, hi, i think abhijit uh, all right we have we have a comment here go ahead Please. sorry to comment in between mom um, good evening or good morning, Paz. Uh, so I, so this was a really great conversation. So I have one question. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, like you know, if I want to enjoy solitude, and like being a male privileged uh, in the society, I can just go to any cafe or any park on my own. So my female friends all, uh, like I, like when they ask me how should they. How could they enjoy? I have no answer. So, I mean, if you can come up with something that how could in future um, these public spaces be more inclusive and so that they can enjoy solitude as well. Like uh, just going to a mall at night or going for a walk in the park in the evening, just enjoying the breeze and like, yeah. I think that's a very relevant question. In fact, Paz, how do we break the tyranny? That's that's where it's mm. coming from. Yeah, it's it's interesting what you say. Uh, so the, I, I discussed this uh, as well in my in my class about the, the idea of the planner, Uh and how there's a, another book that I can recommend. I think it's called The Impossible Flaneurs, something like that. Uh, uh, uh. Mm. I'm going to send you just a link. Um, this is not the the the. This is not the reading, but maybe you can follow up from there. Uh, so the idea of the flaneur, of someone who's who can enjoy <laughs> being in the city, as you were saying, you know, I can enjoy solitude. I can just be outside and by myself and just do nothing. It's a privilege that we usually don't have. Um. So I think that uh, it's something that we can build uh, build up uh, slowly, and and maybe we we won't be able to enjoy ourselves in solitude, 
but we might be able to enjoy ourselves in sisterhood in a community when we open up spaces at the at, at the beginning so a lot of people uh, and my students tell me when they go on this um, feminist protest they, although they're surrounded by thousands of people but they're surrounded by thousands of women they feel free and they feel uh, safe and they feel that they can just do anything and on the streets um, so the idea of solitude as being by yourself um, I think that it's more important to feel free even if you're surrounded with people um, so maybe you can start up by opening up spaces where women feel free uh, as a group and with time that will transform into a place where they, you can feel free by yourself even if you're on your own um, but it's a process I, I think it's, it, it's it, there's not uh, one fix uh, for all <laughs> Uh, it's not just one solution that will break down patriarchy and everything because I think that that's impossible, especially if you were just thinking about the urban design, like there's no building that can be built that's going to break down patriarchy. Um, I think it's part of a process, a social process, where our built environment also can respond uh, to that social process. Um, I think that's what I would say. Uh, as I would say, I don't have like a magical solution, unfortunately. Uh, I think it's a process. We all need to kind of collaborate. Uh, interdisciplinarity is really important, so we can like, kind of also break this um, this idea of urban planning being made just by urban planning professionals, and also uh, about uh, only men in this profession. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you have a you. very interesting comment passed by one of our members. He's Avijit, and he writes something very interesting. He says that spaces also provide opportunities and context to develop interpersonal relationships. And he talks about the rural woman in that sense. He's talking about a particular case here in India. And I think um, I'll invite Avijit to, in fact, be a part of this discussion because usually when we tend to talk about gender and space, we're focusing a lot on uh, urban construction and urban interventionist designs. But I think Avijit here has a very valid comment to make. So, Avijit, please, please go ahead. All right, I think we've lost him. Nevertheless, his comment is, um, so Paz, we have the concept of self-help groups here in India. And uh, these self-help groups essentially are collectives uh, which have women participating. And they're micro enterprises in effect. Um, so what he says is that in rural India, formation of SHGs and other such community groups that build upon the social capital have been very empowering where the rural woman has got a space outside her home to interact and share their stories so these do not simply function as micro enterprises in that sense uh, but even as avenues uh, to learn about each other as avenues for uh, empowerment in that sense so i think this is a very interesting dimension that he brings to today's talk also about spaces um, as opportunities and spaces as uh, interpersonal relationships. Yeah, the idea of creating a safe space, that doesn't mean you're creating, you know, a building. <laughs> you're creating a space between us, like um, in, in a more intimate uh, understanding of, of yes. space. Um, so I think that's really important to build and also very difficult because as I was saying, the lack of time is always, uh, it's always a burden for women, especially those who have children, etc., or have to take care for someone like an um, elderly pa parent or someone who's sick or etc. Uh, so I guess um, whenever we, and this is something that I've been thinking about lately, um, whenever we meet, Make sure you have childcare facilities or you have the opportunity of taking turns so some, some people can look after 
everyone else while the other people can gather and you know you can rotate or whatever but finding a balance between your caring activities so you can conduct yourself you conduct all their activities it's, it's vital so whenever now i think that now when you go to an academic conference there are child care facilities so you can you know go with your children if you have to um changing the time of our meetings is also crucial <laughs> Don't meet whenever you have to do a lot of, of housework because no one's going to show up. Uh, things like that that you can consider to kind of play around the idea that some things cannot be changed, but some other you could, you know, manage around. All right. Thank you so much. Do we have more questions? Uh, Ma'am, uh, sorry, I got lost in between. Yes, like that's all right, Avijit. In case you want to say something, please go ahead. Uh, I would like to bring another picture from like the rural India. So, uh, like, like in India, if we see the rural population, like uh, most of the population still practices open defecation in India. Uh, but like for the past few years, like government is focusing on uh, building toilets for the uh, in in rural rural parts of like India. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I see like uh, when I visit these places that it's, it's a complete failure because though the toilets are being built, but uh, both men and women uh, prefer open defecation because uh, it has become a part of their culture. So uh, I think uh, uh, like while like uh, like allocating funds or uh, doing anything like in any part of the country like. We must not like enforce whatever that is being practiced in the urban or in uh, in, in the urban side or or the practices which are uh, in the rural side to to the urban culture. So uh, these are very context specific things. So one of my friend is working in the, in the rural parts of India. So he tried to understand the problem that even if the toilets are being built, why people are not using it. So uh, the actual issue here is that uh, in india like uh, this this like going to open defecation together as a group for women is a socialization process because uh, they, they work for the entire day and in the evening they meet each other and share their stories talk to them and when they use their private toilet inside their home this thing is completely missing so they prefer like going to open defecation or going for open defecation have casual talk and all those things so uh, actually uh, one of my friends, like Steve, uh, brought the concept of a community toilet in uh, like few district of Maharashtra in India, where uh, like people can uh, openly like talk, speak while they are using this uh, community toilet. So this concept become a hit, which is like uh, uh, like completely different, like different from what we practice in the ur uh, in, in in the ur urban India. So I think uh, like. Contextual understanding is very much important. Like either we bring any change uh, uh, in the urban scenario or the rural scenario. So th that's what I, I wanted to talk about. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a fantastic uh, example. Thank you. Well, th definitely, there's so many diff cultural differences between urban and rural uh, areas. Uh, of course, within our countries as well, and and. Most of the kind of uh, technical decisions uh, usually don't uh, acknowledge uh, the cultural differences, uh, whereas these are gender-based or religious-based or whatever. Um, it, and this reminded me of, of another example of um, here, uh, old people, they have to, they can co go and collect their pension to a public office where you go and collect your pension. And what they did is that to make this process more efficient, they would um, just uh, make an electronic transfer and make a deposit of their pension into their uh, bank account. Uh, and people and all people were really disappointed because the, every month they had this uh, event and where they, you know, they dress up and they go and collect their pension and there they meet other people and maybe they go for coffee together. So collecting your pension, it wasn't just an, um, you know, like an economic transaction. It was also a social 
uh, event where you meet people and you go out of your home and you dress up and uh, so we in when we think about this uh, this uh, kind of technical technocratic uh, decisions uh, we usually lost touch with the more cultural and as I would say we were talking about this kind of mundane symbolic uh, uh, issues that are intertwined with the, or in, in our everyday life. So thank you for, for your comment. I think that's a great example of how, you know, something like sanitation measures sometimes can clash with the, with the other kind of cultural um, activities as well. All right, I think since we're running short of time, I think we'll just yes. close for today. Thank you so much, Priya, for organizing and for inviting me. Thank you me. so much, Dina Paz. Fantastic. Dina Paz Concha, uh, thank you. I, I also have enjoyed so much of like your comments because we're, we're in, a, in completely different parts of the world, but our concerns are very similar, and I think that speaks uh, volumes about how important it is to kind of or network in, in this uh, in this conversation. Exactly. And I think we had so much to learn today about how um, the seemingly innocuous and the mundane two embodies power, for that matter, technology, uh, construction, spatial organization, all of them just might seem so uh, commonplace, but they're not necessarily and they carry with them a lot of uh, semiotic meanings as well. So I think today's uh, lecture has been very insightful, very refreshing in fact, because uh, Viram is now soon to launch its third segment on gender and space, and uh, we are referring to it as Than, where we will be examining, of course, not only the territoriality of space, but also the psychology of space in terms of its effects on mental well-being. And uh, thank you, Paz, for having uh, the time for all of us and a big hearty uh, thank you from Viram and hope to have you once again for uh, a series of discussions that Viram is going to launch uh, once a fortnight. So yes, and many thanks to your student for joining us. May we know her name please? Thank you. I, I don't know if she's still there. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sure she's still there. I'm sure she says hi. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.